Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest edition of our C19 Business Recovery Response webinar series. Can we ask that you please keep microphones on mute, cameras off, and we'd like to let you know that the presentation section of the webinar will be recorded. I'm James Lamphill. I work at the University of Kent in the Knowledge Exchange and Innovation Department as a Business and Industry Relationship Officer. We act as a gateway into the university, helping to connect industry with the wealth of expertise that resides within and can help your business succeed through supporting innovation, creativity and enterprise. Our webinar today forms part of the HR network, where we run a series of networking events, webinars, a LinkedIn knowledge sharing group and our annual conference in November. We'd like to extend our thanks to HR Go for sponsoring this year's network. Uh, the MD Rodo Barrow would like to say a few words about the HR Go group. Over to you, Roddy. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, and on this lovely sunny day, uh, HR Go is delighted to be sponsoring this HR Networks webinar again. And for those that don't know HR Go, um, we are headquartered in Kent and have 35 branches across the UK. We also have representation in Poland and Australia, and we handle both temporary and permanent placements. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Dawn Nicholson today. Um, decision making has been so pertinent for me in the last 12 months, particularly from a business point of view, that certainly when COVID first started back in, in March last year, um, our business numbers went from something over, around the 4,000 mark down to just 1900 temps being employed and the scenario for me was that the business was then going to hemorrhage cash thereafter so we had to set up uh, what I referred to in stolen the uh, the government uh, term of a cobra meetings every morning with my senior executive team to handle that to make fast and from our point of view we were able to turn it around and today that we have something uh, just over nine and a half thousand workers working for us and actually the business grew 35% last year. So thank you very much. Um, delighted to have you all here today and uh, back to you, Jim. Thank you, Roddy. Um, if you'd like to learn more about, about the HR Network, please feel free to join our LinkedIn group, email hrnetwork at kent.ac.uk or search for the hashtag Kent HR Network on social media. We put some links for the groups and contact details in the comments section below. During the course of the webinar, we would welcome your questions, which you can direct message to me or place in the chat function, and these will be posed at the end of the talk. So today's webinar is hosted by Dr. Dawn Nicholson from the School of Psychology and is titled Making Effective Business Decisions After COVID-19. Um, a really relevant subject area, as just touched on by Roddy, perhaps now even more so than normal. Um, really excited to learn more. Dawn, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Okay, I actually I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen and then I'll say a little bit more about how the session is going to work. So just let me bring up the presentation. Okay, so thank you everyone uh, for that introduction and thank you to HR Go again for uh, all of your sponsorship. So let me um, uh, run through how it's going to look today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am uh, and give you a bit of information uh, about my background and why I'm quite as interested as I am in decision making. And then I'm going to talk about a particular concept within, um, within psychology, which is something called the hidden profile, which actually is an interesting and useful proxy, if you like, for decision making. And then I'm going to talk about uh, system one and system two, some systems that we all have and how that imp uh, implicates when, we, when it comes to things like unconscious bias. Then I'm going to spend some time talking about some decision making interventions. I'll focus on three devil's advocacy, mindfulness and my own intervention that I developed uh, during the course of my PhD, which is based on mental simulation, which is a very posh way of saying let's pretend basically. And I'm going to wrap up with some of my top tips, I think, for decision making opportunity for a Q&A. Now, as we go through, I will from time to time ask you just to drop a few things into the uh, into the chat. I have uh, just a few questions that I want to ask. I won't, won't really react to, to the stuff that's coming through in the chat. I'm just interested to see what people say in response to some of these things. Um, you can drop your questions into the chat, but we will have uh, a longer time towards the end for Q&A. Um, and after the Q&A, I'll also just share some contact details with you. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. 
Uh, I'm an avid user of LinkedIn. Uh, I post a lot, probably far too much. Um, and I'll just um, share some links with you about uh, some useful material that I have hopefully um, shared on LinkedIn. So that's the way the, the session is going to run, basically. Uh, so who am I? So basically, as Jim said, I'm a lecturer now at the University of Kent. I'm a, I'm a chartered psychologist, uh, and I'm also a fellow of the Association for Business Psychology. Pretty fancy titles, huh? Um, what do they all mean? Well, uh, really, it means that over the course of the last, I suppose, many years, probably 40, 40 odd years, uh, I have uh, spent a lot of time thinking, talking, working in business, basically. Um, I spent nearly 30 years working in business, uh, in uh, consulting and also in HR, including for the firms that you see listed here. I actually did my first degree here at Kent back in the 80s. I graduated in 1985 with a degree in English and American literature. So, of course, it seems highly appropriate that I would end up working for Arthur Anderson doing expatriate tax um, and from then into Morgan Stanley and from then from there to PwC. So I suppose in a sort of pre-COVID streak of brilliance, I guess, uh, I'd like to think anyway. Uh, I got to the age of 50 and decided that if I was going to do something else, the moment was then. So I decided to do a bachelor's in psychology. So having done my first degree at Kent, I felt that I probably should come back to Kent. So I spent three years doing a bachelor's in psychology, sitting in the uh, sitting in the lecture theatres and the classrooms with students who were way, way younger than me, 19, 20, 21. Um, and I'm pretty sure, in fact, I know for a fact that I came to them with many preconceptions about them. And they came to me with many preconceptions about people like me. So I guess for both of us, it was something of an educational experience in more ways than one. And then after I've been, I suppose, in decision making to have free reign, uh, and so I decided to do a PhD in decision making. So my research now focuses on both group and individual decision making. I believe that fundamentally decision making is, a, is the most underrated skill. I just said this to Roddy before you guys came on. Everyone kind of goes, well, you know, we can all make decisions. Well, sure. But can we make good decisions? Can we make the right decisions? Can we make them with other people? Can we make them on our own? Um, and increasingly, I'm also interested in a field of work that looks at how uh, humans and AI make decisions together. You know, there are lots of places now where humans and, and AI are working together. Um, if I'm the human in that relationship, how do I feel about my fellow decision, fellow AI? So these are the kind of things that uh, sort of fascinate me. Uh, as I say, it's kind of bordering on obsessions at, at times. So um, why do we need to make good decisions? Um, so really most decisions in everyday life are made by groups rather than individuals in some way, shape or form, right? Um, you know, corporate strategy is decided by boards of directors or exec boards. Uh, it's congresses and parliaments rather than individual leaders who take decisions for countries or nations. Even with then your family, right? You make decisions together, whether it's about budget, whether it's about, you know, the food that you're going to eat um, or whatever, it's typically not, le not left to uh, individual family members. So lots of reasons why we need to sort of think about decision making and the way that we make decisions. And I actually think COVID has had quite an interesting effect on decision making because, you know, it's removed some of the things that we take for granted. Like maybe you always went to the supermarket on a certain day at a certain place. Maybe you always bought the same things. Uh, and actually COVID has, has made some of those decisions more complicated, right? They're not automatic anymore. Maybe you couldn't get toilet roll in Sainsbury's. Maybe you couldn't get tins of chopped tomatoes in Waitrose or whatever. Um, and you've had to think a little bit differently about you know, where you might go shopping or, um, or what, you might, uh, what you might actually eat. Um, and I think you know, COVID has made decision-making a little bit more, uh, more difficult. Certainly I know the decision about whether or not to have another piece of chocolate has become increasingly difficult for me. Uh, over COVID, I have to say. Now, um, groups, we all work in groups, right? Pretty much all of the time. I mean, um, in most organizations, groups are deployed in, in numerous, numerous tasks. And it, it's hard to get a sort of overall picture 
um, of um, the percentage of organizations that use groups and teams. And I'll use the two interchangeably for this purposes. But estimates suggest, you know, what you see here, as much as sort of 30 to 55 percent in the USA, around 45, 50 percent in Canada, about 50 percent in Europe and about 65 percent in the UK. And, you know, if you think about your own workplaces, uh, and certainly this is true of many workplaces that I know, you know, they've even changed a lot of their processes, a lot of their um, decision making, but even processes beyond that to sort of create more groups and bring and bring groups together and, you know, bring people from different parts of the organization together. And yet, when you talk to executives, uh, and this is a piece of research that was done by um, done by my friends at McKinsey a few years back. When you talk to senior executives, there seems to be a bit of a mixed view on the quality of decision making in their organizations. Um, as, many, as much as 60% of senior executives sort of suggested that in their organizations, bad strategic decisions were as frequent as good. 12% um, of senior executives felt that good decisions were altogether infrequent, which is kind of interesting, right? Because you sort of think, well, what are all those high powered people who are sitting around those tables doing if all these, you know, fairly grim decisions are, are emerging. But most of the, but the McKinsey research suggests that it, it's the actual process of making the decision rather than the content of the decision that accounts for the very, it's not to do with the complexity of the decision. It's not to do with the amount of data that someone has to actually take in or absorb or whatever. And these are things that I think have changed over the years but it's the way the decision-making process itself actually runs. The rest is down to either industry or company variables. And McKinsey being McKinsey, you know, even sort of tried to put a financial cost as it were on the quality, uh, on the impact of um, poor decision-making. And they came up with uh, this little interesting statistic, which is that if you could actually take your decision-making process and elevate it from the bottom of the class, i.e. to a sort of top of class performance, then you could actually increase your return on investment uh, by as much as 7% from those decisions. So I think, you know, some fairly compelling data there for, um, for good decision making. So uh, I'm going to use some sort of psychological uh, speak in this. The reason that I, uh, I'm going to use psychological speak in this is, um, is because there are concepts in psychology that are useful to us when it comes to studying well, a whole variety of things, but decision making is one of them. Um, you know, people might say, well, why don't you just walk into an organization and study the way that they make decisions in the organization, then you're right in the field. Uh, and I mean, that's one way of thinking about it, but you know, anything could be going on, you know, if employees, for example, are disgruntled for any reason that could impact on decision making outcomes. If someone had a bad commute that could come on that could have an uh, impact on decision making outcomes. So when it comes to sort of research um, in these areas, amongst other areas, we, we kind of try to do this in a fairly controlled environment. Um, and then, uh, then it is about sort of trying to understand how the research that we uh, that we do can actually then generalize into a workplace. So this is a concept called the hidden profile. Uh, and the hidden profile is sort of a, a useful proxy uh, for real what real group decision making looks um, and, and feels like. Um, and this began to be researched back in the 1980s. And I think a few interesting points have emerged from hidden profile research. And you may recognize some of these things, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions about some of these things as we go along. So, so be ready, right? So first of all, when, when we are going through our group discussions and our group decisions, you know, we like consensus. We don't like argument, right? For a variety of reasons. But principally, we try to reach a consensus. So ultimately, where, whether we like, whether we recognize it or not, we're trying to get to a place where, you know, everyone is in on the same page to some to some degree and we're looking also to pool information and expertise in order to hopefully reach the best or the correct decision now i think that's an interesting distinction because you know the correct decision is not always clear to us then and there you know if you were going to uh, i don't know hire dawn you might think hey you know we're going to hire dawn but actually in six months time, it may be clear that Dawn was not the right hire. So you can only make the correct decision as it were based on, based on that time. 
But there are a couple of interesting things that emerge. So first of all, is that we like to discuss information that we all share, right? Um, and that, it, it, but it's those critical pieces of unique information, the one thing that might make a fundamental difference to the outcome of the decision. Uh, those are much harder to get into the discussion in the first place. Um, and even if they get into the discussion, it's actually harder to have those pieces of information heard, have those pieces of information understood, let alone have them integrated into the discussion. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, it's something called a meta-analysis, which basically looks at a whole sort of host of research that's been conducted over the years. Uh, in a meta-analysis of 65 studies, um, it was, it was ascertained that groups who sort of sh share information in a different type of way or have this hidden profile type setup are eight times less likely to make the correct decision. Now you may already be thinking, well, what is she talking about hidden profiles, you know, but, but bear with me, it will become clearer. So this is, an in, this is a little uh, diagram which looks at how and when groups are likely to outperform individuals when it comes to decision making. Because another, there's an in, inherent assumption, I think, that basically runs something along the lines of, hey, if we all get together in a group, we're much more likely to make a better decision. Not so, okay, not necessarily the case. Um, but this particular diagram suggests that there are only certain scenarios where groups are likely to outperform either for disparate individuals, um, or, um, or, or individual even working on their own. And that is in a couple of instances. First of all, where information is distributed asymmetrically amongst the group members. What do I mean by that? It means that you don't necessarily all hold the, the same information, or you may be coming from different perspectives. So if I'm the head of HR, maybe I'm coming from one perspective. If I'm the head of finance or the CFO, I'm coming from a different perspective. If I'm the head of marketing, I'm coming, I'm coming from a different perspective. We may all ultimately be trying to get to the same place, but at the end of the day, we may not necessarily have all of the same pieces of information. Or even if I give you a piece of paper with the same information on it, because of your particular job expertise, because of your particular focus, your perspective, you may be highlighting different pieces of information than I'm highlighting, for example. So first of all, we all sort of have information that's distributed separately amongst us. But then there's a second piece, and I think this is an important piece, and this is to do with how information is, is, is processed, basically. And um, basically, outperforming is only going to be likely if information processing is symmetric, basically. What do I mean by symmetric? It means if certain biases, certain challenges that we all face as individuals who share and process information are missing from the group discussion or we're able to overcome them. So let's just put a little bit of color on that. These, if you see down the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the left-hand side of the, of the screen, it says group level processes and individual level processes. So these are the types of biases that I'm talk talking about. And there are a couple of biases that operate at the group level and one that operates at the individual. Now, in my view, they all kind of ultimately mix and mingle basically but they have potentially different impacts and over, over, overlapping impacts when it comes to group decision-making. So we have this idea of negotiation focus. Uh, the group discussion is about a preference negotiation. Well, I kind of like Dawn, you know, she likes Harry, he likes David. So let's kind of talk about how we get to a place where, you know, I kind of maybe get what I want, but maybe I'm gonna have to compromise a little bit. Um, but that preference negotiation means that we may focus only on certain types of information that kind of support our preference. We have this idea of discussion bias. So shared information, pieces of information that we all shared. Hey, look, you know, Dawn worked for X firm. Harry worked for Y firm. We all have that piece of information. That in piece of information is going to get into the group discussion much more easily and it's likely to be repeated much more often. We also, at an individual level, like our own information. We always think our own information is better than most other people's information. Yeah, well, I hear, I hear what she's saying, but you know what? I've got this piece of information and I'm pretty sure my piece of information is actually a bit better than her piece of information. 
And that can lead to something called ownership bias. Um, it means that basically, again, I favor the information that I've got and I'm going to consciously or unconsciously, we can debate that. I'm going to share those pieces of information and I'm probably also going to only hear the pieces of information that sort of support the information that I've got basically. So there are some key reasons why groups fail to share information. So we invariably, we already have formed an opinion, right? And if you think about the, uh, the way that a lot of group meetings are run, you know, normally what happens is someone sends out a whole bunch of papers and says, will you take a look at these, you know, in the interest of saving some time. Uh, and by the way, you know, please come to the table having at least looked at the data pack and be ready to sort of share some views and some thoughts. Even if I say to you, you know, don't formulate an opinion as you go through those documents or whatever they are, invariably certain things start jumping out at you. You might think, oh yeah, that's interesting. Uh, or you might highlight this, or you might highlight that or whatever. Um, so consciously or unconsciously, you're forming an opinion either for or against. As I alluded to previously, you value your own information more, something called ownership bias. We like social validation as well. So we value information which can be validated by other group members. So if I say, hey, I saw this about Davina and someone else goes, oh yeah, so did I. I saw that too, I saw that too. We feel good, we like that. It makes us think, oh, I'm not silly here. You know, everyone else saw that or, or whatever. We rely on majority rules and we spend time justifying the majority decision. So how many times have you gone into a room and said, okay, who thinks A, who thinks B, who thinks C? Okay, it seems to me that, you know, nine out of 10 of us like A, let's talk about why we like A. How many times do you actually go to the one person who, uh, who didn't choose A and say, okay, tell us what you didn't like about A? So then we're really spending our time justifying the majority decision. We also have social pressures, right? I mean, invariably in groups, there is a hierarchy, there's a dynamic, right? Someone's more senior, someone's more junior, maybe someone's got more power, whatever, right? Um, and power can have uh, you know, quite an effect on how uh, information is shared um, and how um, attitudes are formed, right? You know, if, if the boss is basically saying, hey, you know, I wanna hire Dawn and someone thinks, oh, I'm sure that's a mistake. You know, at what point do you kind of say yay or nay about that, right? So, um, so, so power, social pressure can have quite an impact. We also have this idea of resistance. What do I mean by resistance? To change an attitude actually is effortful, right? Even if it's our own attitude, let alone changing someone, someone else's attitude. Um, and so it requires us to put effort in. It requires us to open our minds, open our eyes, open our ears um, to differences different perspectives, differences of opinion. And we all like to think that we do this automatically. Um, and, you know, myself included, but I know that actually, I may be starting from some of these positions. Well, okay, you know, I, I'm kind of hearing, but I'm not hearing, do you know what I mean? We've probably all sat in rooms like that, right? And then time pressure, you know, time pressure is, is not a, is not uh, a great um, help when it comes to decision-making. But we, so we have an urgency for closure, right? The, for the closer we get to the allotted time for the meeting, let's say we've got an hour in, the more likely we are to be thinking, oh, we need to get this decision made. Uh, okay, Dawn, I hear you. You know, I hear about that one vital piece of information that you've got, but I've got four minutes. We need to make this decision. It's six months since we had someone in this post. We need to get someone in. It's six months since we, you know, made a decision about just talked about this product. We need to make a decision, right? And that time pressure can have an impact. Now, we're also guilty of, you know, imposing time pressure when there doesn't need to be one, right? So, I mean, I've, I've had scenarios like this where it's like, okay, we've carved out an hour for a, a, um, a, a meeting, a decision-making meeting, a decision-making meeting that pro probably, you know, it's a decision involving probably thousands of people, hundreds of people that involves, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars maybe. And what happens? We get into a room and everyone says, okay, you know, we do the who thinks this, who thinks this, who thinks this. The decision is made in 15 minutes. Oh, great. Aren't we wonderful? Made that decision in 15 minutes. I've got 45 minutes back in my diary. I can go up, back to my desk. 
I can, you know, check on the wife, check on the husband, check on the kids, check on the dog. No one kind of says, well, actually, you know, have we really sort of applied ourselves to making the decision properly? So time, time is not, a, not always a great friend when it comes to making decisions. And this presents, you know, problems for organizations. Well, as we said, more and more groups of employees are making decisions under conditions of differing knowledge and expertise. You know, when I was working in the organizations that I was working for, I was making decisions next to the treasury guys, next to the finance guys, next to the operations guys. It wasn't all just, you know, uh, one group of like-minded people. There were different perspectives that needed to be brought together. So we have, you know, all these different perspectives. You also know that, you know, group work is much more prevalent in organizations and particularly with multiple departments and divisions, you know, launching a new product. Okay, well, there's not just five of us in that discussion. I've got the marketing guys. I've got the R&D guys. I've got someone else. I've got someone else. You know, there's a whole bunch of people in that discussion. Um, so the focus within these organizations has really been to sort of strive for greater teamwork and, and more task interdependency. You know, your job is more dependent on others around you outside of your department or whatever. And, you know, we've all probably gone through processes where we've actually redesigned jobs specifically with this in mind. You know, remember the mantra? The more diversity there is, the better the group decision. OK, well, you know, we can debate that. Depends whether the diversity is being listened to. That's my sort of starting point for that particular particular debate. But, you know, more and more people involved in the decision making process. You know, it's also about giving people a voice, making them feel that like they're being listened to and getting those different perspectives. So decision making failures at the group level in particular, you know, are a challenge when it comes to organizations. So I want to uh, um, just, just pause briefly and just um, just ask you this question. You can just drop drop your answers into the chat, basically. So given everything that I've said and what you've experienced as well, just think about what might prevent you from sharing information in a group setting. GDPR, yeah. Confidentiality, yeah. Overpowering person in the group, yeah. Different hierarchies, for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, these are all, all things that potentially could, you know, fear of being wrong. I mean, this is a big one. Helen S. Absolutely. I'm going to come to this in a moment, actually. Security, making the wrong decision, disagreeing with the boss, personal information, competitor awareness. Yeah, lots of things here. Pressure from more senior colleagues not wanting to make an unpopular suggestion. Decision is already made by the persons with power. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely seen that. You know, when you, I've, I've walked into rooms and I know that people have positioned themselves in certain places on the table so that they can watch each other's faces and know how the decision's going to go, right? I mean, you know, um, so these, these things happen, right? Or the water cooler conversation that's gone on beforehand, or you see them in the room together beforehand, and it's like, okay, you know, is, is this real? Culture differences? Yeah, culture differences, really interesting. You know, I mean, I think there's a view that collectivist cultures, Asia, for example, uh, China, Japan, those types of places, maybe they make, maybe they're better at making decisions. But actually, in those cultures, you know, to disagree from a hierarchical perspective, it's almost unheard of, right? So neurodiversity, yeah, these are all great. Okay, fantastic. Let's move on. Um, so lots of things that could prevent you from sharing information. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about um, some of these biases in a little bit more, a uh, little bit more detail. So one of the big ones is uh, confirmation bias. Uh, I put IPE there because there's a sort of cycle, um, a, a psycho babbly term for this, which is the individual preference effect. But we've probably all seen this, right? We make a quick judgment about someone or something. And then what do we do? We look for the information to confirm the judgment. We ignore the information which would show that to be wrong, right? It could be anything. Oh, I quite like the idea of buying X car, Y pair of shoes. Let me Google all the positive reviews about this, right? 
I mean, I do this myself, right? I see this product, I think, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at for all the good reviews. Uh, oh, maybe there are a couple of bad reviews. I'm not, I'm not going to take any notice of this. And, you know, particularly when it comes to interviewing, I mean, you know, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of people in my time. I know that I've been guilty of this, right? 60% of interviewers make a decision about a candidate's suitability within 15 minutes of interviewing them. Probably faster, right? Those of you who've interviewed, how many times have you done that? How many times have you thought someone walks into the room and you think, yeah, no, mm, maybe. Um, so, you know, this is, a, this is a challenge, right? And there are various reasons for this, right? As human beings, there are a couple of things that we don't like. One is something called cognitive dissonance. This is a lovely psychological term for sort of feeling uncomfortable, knowing one thing, thinking another thing. I wish I hadn't bought that, whatever. But actually, I'm going to find all of the ways to justify why I did buy that. I wish I hadn't done X. I'll find lots of ways to justify why I did X. Because we need to get ourselves back to a comfortable state. Anything that takes us away from that comfortable state is a sort of threat to ourselves. And as human beings, first and foremost, we don't like that, right? You don't like to lie in bed and think, oh, I wish I, I, wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that which that hadn't happened, you know, like we all, all do and all have done. Confirmation bias is interesting because some recent research that I've done suggests that maybe, just maybe, confirmation bias might manifest itself different, differently um, by gender. So, and there is actually some research from the advertising arena, particularly, which seems to back this up, right? So relative to males, women, engage in a more detailed elaboration of message content. What do I mean by that? They get into the nitty gritty. Um, whereas for guys, it seems that they're more looking at the bigger picture, right? The big, what's the big picture here? What are the overall messages? What are the overall themes? When it comes to information processing, again, there's a difference suggested by lots of pieces of research. It seems that men, again, are, you know, processing information across the piece, whereas women are again getting down into the more detailed, more specific way. Um, same with the way that we actually attend to information. So everything suggests that maybe women and men are not necessarily approaching information in the same way. Males process information selectively. Females a little bit more. Again, this sense of a detailed processing style. And then an effect of confidence noted when it comes to decision making. And this was a piece of research that was done based on, you know, one of these sort of um, take it or leave it cash games in the United States, and which suggests that confidence actually plays a role, that women sort of are influenced by their bad play, i.e. getting it wrong, um, whereas men actually are only focused on what they've done well. So all of this sort of, let's not just say one is better than the other, just recognizing that there are differences here in the way that men and women, you know, look at information, process information, are confident with information. And I think that's interesting because, you know, if you think about intragroup diversity for a moment, you, know, you bring groups together and everything is kind of done as a sort of, you know, one size fits all. Let's bring the group together and let's, let's sort of coach everyone, train everyone. But actually, maybe when it comes to groups and group decision making, maybe this sort of one size fits all approach isn't necessarily the right one. So, you know, the gender differences that I've just spoken, spoken about, maybe getting the material 24 hours before the meeting is fine for the, you know, the guys in the meeting, maybe for the women who kind of want to do that deep, more detailed or seem to need to do that more deep, deep dive. Maybe they need to have the information a week before the meeting, right? What about time to make the decision? Do those processing differences equate to different time frames for the decision? I can't make my decision in an hour. I can make my decision in an hour, but I can't make my decision in an hour. But then, you know, there's a logistical side to this, right? Isn't there? Where do you draw the line, right? Okay, fine. Well, I can't get the material out to dawn 20, you know, seven days before the meeting. So we have to sort of take those differences and perhaps be more aware of those differences when it comes to the diversity within the groups that we're working with. Now, 
communication apprehension in the uh in the, the chat in the, the chat question that i just had someone basically said uh talked about i won't say something because i'm afraid of you know maybe i'm afraid of looking like an idiot or i'm saying the wrong thing or whatever basically right there's actually a, a phrase for this in psychology and it's called communication apprehension right um, and communication apprehension is basically the fear or anxiety associated associated with real or anticipated right you can have that even before you walk into the room anticipated communication with another person and there is some research on intercommunication apprehension um, and which suggests that you know people are less likely to express their own opinion in face-to-face -face settings particularly when discussing a sensitive issue if you think about communication apprehension, you know, someone who is newer to the group, someone who is a more junior group member, I mean, in a way, maybe they're, maybe it seems more likely that they will be prone to communication apprehension. But if they're the owners of those, you know, critical pieces of unique information, then maybe they're the ones who actually hold the key to the right decision. But if they're afraid of actually putting that piece of information into the group discussion in the first place, that could be a problem for us, right? And there's also some research that's been uh, that's been uh, taken uh, in terms of assessment centers, right? You know, the, the blue ribbon of how to hire people run an assessment center, right? But communication apprehension has been shown in these contexts to be negatively related to critical thinking, i.e. communication apprehension can actually impair critical thinking and also oral communication in a group discussion, okay? So communication apprehension, something that we have to be aware of so here's my next little task for you let's just think about any situations that you've been in where you yourself may have experienced communication apprehension you don't need to go into details um but but how did it make you feel how did it make you act um and if you're you know a senior person do you think how do you think your team members may feel about something like uh the this scenario do you think you think your team members may have experienced any communication apprehension at any point just drop your answers into the chat for me Yeah, nervous and uncomfortable. People are looking down on a person for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Can make you freeze. I felt cross with myself for being silent, perpetuating the feeling of anxiety. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting, Marianne. I don't listen as fully to the other members of the team because I'm thinking about what their reaction will be for sure. Uh, Roddy, yep, junior members never wish to make a fool of themselves in front of a boss. Yeah, absolutely. I can always remember, particularly when I was, you know, younger and more junior, thinking, I'll get my comment in first and I'll say something that, that, you know, probably was a piece of shared information, right? Because then I've made an impact and I don't need to say anything else for the rest of the meeting. Anyone recognize that scenario, right? So, yeah, communication apprehension, again, can really sort of be a challenge when it comes to getting the right piece, you know, get it out of the way, right? Interviews, group discussions, yeah. Yeah, very mindful of what is going on around me. Listen first, speak later. Yeah, absolutely. But again, you know, you you might hold the key. You may, may hold that piece of vital information that we need, need to get out there, right? So for sure. Okay. So I'm going to move on to uh, something called escalation of commitment. I mean, you've got to give it to psychology, right? I mean, you know, some of these phrases are just fantastic, right? So I actually, I love this escalation of commitment. And we probably, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make the next statement in a moment. So what is it? The I love this. The proclivity for decision makers to maintain commitment to losing courses of action, even in the face of quite negative news. What does that mean? It means, hey, you know something is going badly. what I just I can't quite bring myself to to stop it right I can't leave it alone for whatever reason right so this is what we, we probably all immediately are thinking I, I I've been there I recognize this so you know it occurs 
when decision makers maintain their commitment to losing courses of action, even in the face of negative news, right? That product's not selling. Okay, let's give it a bit longer. That person's not working out. Well, it's only three months, you know, let's be fair. You know, you've been there, right? The bus is not coming. Oh, I'll give it five more minutes. So, you know, we've all been here, right? Uh, a couple of preconditions, right? Generally, we feel to some degree personally responsible for initiating the losing course of action. You made us wait for the bus. Yeah, okay, I did. Just give it a bit more time, right? And, you know, in some way, shape, shape or form, you've committed yourself. You've committed yourself to the irrevocable behavior. Yeah, but if we start walking out of the next bus stop and the bus comes and we miss it. Uh... And there are lots of examples of this, right? Finance, marketing, accounting. Talked about waiting for the bus that never comes. Sticking in a relationship that you know is failing. Hanging on to a friend that you think, you know what, this is toxic. I should cut it off right now. Plenty, plenty of examples, right? And lots of real life examples. You know, the big dig, big construction project that ran in Boston, but years and years and years and years, massively over budget. Nick Leeson, the rogue trader, I'll just put another trade on tomorrow. I'm sure I can get the money back. And the next day, and the next day, Bearings Bank RIP, you know? Fukushima, Brexit, we could debate that, right? I mean, you know, so, so lots of examples of escalation of commitment. Typically in these scenarios, you know, large amounts of resources have already been invested, right? Money, time, effort, but notwithstanding the investment, the project is in danger of failing or it's just a sort of stream of negative feedback, right? Expectations have not been met. And then, you know, someone comes and says, okay, we have to make a decision. Are we gonna kind of continue with this project? Are we gonna put more money in, put more resources in, or are we just gonna walk away from it, right? An escalation of commitment is that tendency to continue the investment despite evidence of loss, right? And it's, it's not rational because what would be rational at that point, of point in time is to look at it and say, okay, yep, yeah, there's a sunk cost, but it is a sunk cost. What does the future look like? If I look at this now, knowing everything that I know and look forward and project into the future, what's the right answer? You know, but we can't take ourselves away from that previous investment and that's why it's an irrational decision basically so again i'm going to ask you to just sort of pause for a little moment and think about any scenarios that you may have been in recently and it, hey it might be even you know eating that extra piece of chocolate uh, where you think you have escalated your commitment and just uh, drop drop a couple of examples into the chat for me <laughs> I see a comment in here about waiting for the bus five more minutes and then you've been there for an hour for sure. Feeling relationship really resonated. Yeah, committing more time to assignments, dedicating your time effectively. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Bad investment choices. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just leave it there. I mean, it's lost a bit of money, but I'm sure it'll come back. Commitment, investment on projects. Yep. Yeah. Oh, if I just, maybe I'm not trying hard enough. Maybe I just need to just put a bit more effort behind that and get it over the line. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Um, so all, all, all good answers. Okay, all right. Now, I wanna say a little bit about virtual teams because you know, this is, this is where we are right now, right? So in a, even in a pre-pandemic picture, uh, um, a survey that was done sort of, you know, I think back in 2016, basically found that um, from, Third, over nearly 1,400 respondents drawn from 80 different countries said that 85% um, stated that virtual teams were job critical. Uh, and, you know, many corporate teams are, are, are also often virtual. Uh, again, pre-pandemic, you know, around about 40 odd percent never actually met in person. 
Um, and it's certainly the case that more and more decisions are being made online by virtual groups. And that obviously is probably even higher now, 100%, uh, given the pandemic. But you know, not this concept of the difficulties of knowledge sharing is also problematic in virtual teams, right? Um, and there is research that suggests that um, you know, face to face, the lack of face to face engagement can make it more difficult to achieve trust in virtual teams, uh, and that also requires additional time and additional energy to basically make those virtual teams more effective to be sharing information more effectively. I mean, I look at my own students, you know, I know that they don't want to put their cameras on, don't necessarily want to speak, happy to, happy to use the chat. Um, and these challenges in virtual teams, and again, we've probably all seen these, are also complicated uh, with technology, lack of knowledge sharing, confidence and ability. Um, and, you know, there, there is suggestion even from sort of res earlier research that these, particularly again, when you're bringing together these teams with different knowledge sets, different perspectives, that uh, when it's happening in virtual teams as well, it can basically act as a barrier to problem solving ability. It can decrease the team's cognitive uh, cognitive togetherness, as it were, and decrease the, the team efficacy. So these are challenges that exist in virtual teams as well. Okay, should I just see something pop into the chat there? Okay, no worries. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, talk about, move, in, move on to talk about system one and system two. What are system one and system two? Well, let me kind of demonstrate what system one and system two might be. So here's a question for you guys. A bat and a ball costs one pound 10 in total. The bat costs a pound more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Just drop your answer into the chat for me. Don't be shy. 10p, yep. 10p. 10p. Can you repeat? A bat and a ball cost one pound ten in total. The bat costs a pound more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Okay, so the correct answer is that the ball costs 5p. The bat costs one pound and five for a total cost of one pound and 10, okay? But you know, hum as humans, we're, um, and we all do this, right? We are cognitive misers. So we often give the first response that comes to mind, 10p, without thinking that actually that can't really be right. Otherwise, the bat would cost one pound and ten, and the total cost would be one pound twenty. Okay. So we kind of reach for it, right? We reach for that answer. This is because we all have these sort of two system, two systems of thinking, right? We have system one. System one is fast thinking, gut instinct. We take shortcuts, useful for day-to-day -day decisions. It's easy on the brain, but it is also prone to biases and errors. It's hard to switch it off, right? Then we have system two, slower thinking, much more measured, much more thoughtful, but it's effortful, it's harder on the brain. We need to engage system two when it comes to difficult decisions and choices. Now, system two isn't perfect. It is not fully protected from biases and errors. We can still make mistakes with system two, but hopefully it's much, much less likely that we'll make mistakes. But system two requires activation. You have to kick it into gear, basically. And like system one has its uses, as I said, it's there to protect us. It's easy on the brain. If we try to process in a full active way, every single piece of information that our poor brain is seeing, we would be overwhelmed, right? Go back to the 
beginning of my chat and the COVID decisions that we have to make. I'm not, I can't go shopping in that shop. I can't, you know, go and buy those things there. I can't go and do that now. I've got to think slightly differently because the things that I took for granted are no longer happening. So keep in mind these two systems because it's these two systems that sort of fundamentally underpin a lot of what goes on with unconscious bias, right? So I like this definition of unconscious bias. Uh, from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, unconscious biases are the views and opinions that we are unaware of. So typically system one, system one, system one, they affect our everyday behavior and decision making. And our unconscious biases are influenced by our background, our culture and our personal experiences, right? I come from the Northeast of England. When I hear the hint, the vaguest hint of a Northeast accent, something happens to me, right? Something happens to me. So, uh, you know, and I'm sure if you, oh, I have two dogs. If someone says, oh, I'm a dog owner, I might immediately assume, oh, well, you must be a great person because, you know, you have dogs, I have dogs. I mean, they may go home and kick their dog. I don't know that, right? But, but this, is what's, this is what's going on with our unconscious biases, right? Oh, you're a cat person. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> I have dogs and cats, you know? So, so, so these are things that, you know, that, that they're there. They're inherent in all of us, basically. Now, I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures. Some, one or two of you, I think, have seen some of this, so, um, uh, so uh, just kind of bear with it. And I want you just, uh, I'm gonna ask you to drop your answer into the chat to tell me what's happening. So here's the first picture. What's going on here? Waiting for the bus, waiting for the bus. Man about to attack woman, okay. Unhappy youth, about to avert a hazard. Man is running towards the woman. Someone might be chasing him. Okay, cool, all right. Let's move it on one. What's happening here? Man about to get hit by the other one. Drawing something on a board. Rescue attempt. Carrying a box. Potential fight. Perhaps one is trying to help the other. Looks like a robbery. Helping carry something. Okay. Now, let me just just bear with me, I need to flip to, I need to share another different screen with you. I just, uh, let's see now. Stop the share for a moment. Sorry, I'll just get my tech sorted out in a moment. Share screen, here we go. This is pretty old, so uh, I apologize for the quality of it. Here we go. An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture, you can fully understand what's going on. Let me go back to my slides. Now, that some of you may recognize that. I mean, um, that that is uh, an advert for The Guardian from the 1970s. Um, probably written at a time before unconscious bias was even a phrase that anyone recognized or, or resonated with anyone. But I, I think it's actually one of the most powerful recommendations that I've ever seen for the dangers of making assumptions, the dangers of jumping to conclusions. Um, so, um, so uh, I would just uh, just sort of 
when, when you get that old system one kicking in, uh, you know, there's generally more to what you can see. So what, what does this tell us about these biases that we have? You know, we all have these biases and blind spots, and sometimes we don't even know that we have them, right? Um, and at times of uncertainty, when we're feeling anxious or we're feeling depleted, as we have been, you know, for now a good few months, system one is likely to be running riot. You know, so we need to sort of be guarding against that in the way that we're making, thinking about decisions and making decisions. Remember that, you know, system two, where we want to be for our decision making, for most of it anyway, it's effortful and it needs activation. Um, and as I alluded to, you know, the pandemic has taken a, a toll. We are all feeling depleted. And this is really when and where we need to be very careful about our decision making processes. So what can we do? I'm going to talk about three processes. I'm going to talk about something called devil's advocacy. You may have heard of, I'm sure. A little bit about mindfulness. Someone, uh, some people love mindfulness. It's not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my own, uh, my own uh, mental simulation, let's pretend intervention, basically. So the devil's advocate, you know, this is quite interesting. It's probably been around, I mean, you're probably all familiar with the phrase, you know, oh, you know, they're playing the devil's advocate, she's playing the devil's advocate. So you ask someone in the group or a subgroup to disagree with the prevailing group view, irrespective of whether they support it or not, right? And that dissent can be useful. You know, if I sit there saying, yes, but, yes, but, what about this, what about that, I don't agree, whatever. That can help to prevent groupthink, you know, where we all just kind of get on the bandwagon. And it can also help to improve decision-making outcomes. I mean, this has become very popular. This uh, devil's advocacy sort of procedure has become very popular in a number of German companies, for example. Uh, in the Vorstand, the sort of management board, they put a lot of their decision-making through this type of process. But, you know, devil's advocacy needs to be quite carefully managed because it can actually lead to adverse consequences for the group process and the group dynamic. Uh, and it may be that, you know, maybe you'll get to a better decision. But actually, if that sort of devil, devil's advocacy process has actually damaged the fabric of the group and people no longer want to work with each other or are reticent about getting behind the implementation of the decision, then that can create problems. You know, if you walk out of the room and think, well, we might have got to the best decision, but boy, Dawn was so unbearable. I never want to work with her again. I mean, what a pain. You know, that, that could be a problem, right? And it also means that, you know, choosing the right person as the devil's advocate is key. You know, if you ask a junior person to be the devil's advocate, are they actually going to be able to sort of play that role to the full? At the same time, you know, you need someone who's got some diplomacy, some you know, political skills or whatever. Um, so devil's advocacy can be very useful, but needs to be sort of carefully managed uh, in order to not have any adverse consequences on the group. Mindfulness. Um, mindfulness, you know, characterized by a sort of focused, non-evaluative attention to an awareness of the present moment, right? So if you're high in mindfulness and there are scales that measure mindfulness, then uh, you are less concerned about the past or the future, you're in the moment. You're more attentive, attentive to the current moment, less likely to be concerned about being evaluated. So maybe you don't really have that sense of evaluation of apprehension that we talked about, uh, communication apprehension. And you know, there is research that has basically shown that uh, higher levels of mindfulness can be associated with a whole host of good things, right? Positive mental health, enhancing co cognitive processing and enhancing various aspects of attention. And it can and has been shown to be helpful in decision-making so it can help you to frame the decision, be aware of the goals, be aware of generating options, avoiding a rational escalation of commitment. It can help with information gathering. It can help with coming to conclusions and implementation, and it can help with uh, learning from feedback, being open to feedback um, and uh, awareness of learning structures. But it can also have negative impacts. Right when it comes to decision making, I mean, I'm a great believer in mindfulness, but um, you know, these th things can always be in danger of being overplayed. So, you know, mindfulness could reduce the quantity of the information being screened. Maybe you're going to miss something. It could slow down decision making at the processing stage. Um, and so, you know, some positives, some negatives, as far as mindfulness is concerned. 
So because I kind of got obsessed about decision making, I thought, okay, that maybe there's a way to sort of come up with, you know, maybe there's a silver bullet. Well, the answer is there's no silver bullet, but but this is a way that I came up with to um, to, to to think of, about improving decision making. And it's something called mental simulation. What is mental simulation? I love this. Imitative cognitive constructions of an event or series of events. What does that mean? It means let's pretend, okay? We all do it, right? Um, and mental simulation has been shown to have, you know, a lot of important psychological and behavioral effects across a wide range of psychology domains, you know, in, in the sports field, for example. You know, I think a lot of coaches use it Imagine that you're going to, you know, win Wimbledon. I think when Djokovic beat Federer, you know, back in 2019, having saved three match points, he spoke about, you know, I, I worked with my mental coach on this and I believed that I could win and blah, 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 and, you know, all of these types of things. It also uh, has been used a lot in the health domains. You know, imagine yourself giving up smoking. Imagine yourself doing more exercise. Um, and it, there's a lots of examples across many different psychological domains where mental simulation has been effective or proven to be effective, prejudice, helping behavior, social judgments, etc. So what did I do with this? So I took this idea of mental stimulation and I thought, okay, how can I apply this to decision making? Um, and basically what I do with my decision making intervention is I ask my decision makers to look into the future just before the decision is baked in, right? So you think this is the way you're gonna go, but before you do that, let's just fast forward. And then I'm gonna tell you that actually the decision that you think you're gonna make has failed, right? And I'm gonna ask you to generate reasons for the failure and identify any potential solutions to the problems. Now, any of you who have heard of something called a pre-mortem, may think that some of this is familiar. And indeed it is, um, because it kind of works on the same concept. There are a few more elements to it. Uh, and the pre-mortem was developed by a guy called Gary Klein and typically used to sort of sound out test implementation plans. So these are the concepts that the mental simulation is based on. Wait, you think you're gonna make that decision? Let's fast forward. By the way, I'm gonna tell you that your decision making, your decision making is poor and your decision's gone wrong. Not that you've made a great decision, not that you're going to win Wimbledon, not that you're going to, you know, whatever, have a positive outcome, that you're going to have a negative outcome. And I want you to tell me why you've got a negative out outcome and how we can overcome that negative outcome. So task one, imagine that the decision you're going to make has failed. Task two, generate reasons for that failure. Why has it gone wrong? What's happened? Task three, identify any solutions, interventions. And then task four, here's where you get the sort of get out of jail. You either can stick with that decision you thought you were going to make or you get an option to go again, right? Because your decision's not baked in at that point. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to ask you to do something here. So I just want you to think about a decision that you've made in the last few days. It doesn't have to be, you know, a big deal. Maybe it was about having that other piece of chocolate or the extra glass of red wine or whatever. Um, so I'm going to ask you to imagine that it's a few weeks down the line or just a few days down the line and the decision that you made has gone wrong, right? Anything could have happened, but the decision that you made has gone wrong. And just think, think of the reasons that that could have happened and just now ask yourself, if you had that decision back again, would you make the same or a different decision? And you don't have to, I'm just going to give you a, a minute or so to think about this because so, I'm conscious of time, um, but just have a little think about it. If you framed it in that negative way, would you make the same decision, basically? Do you think you could have made a better decision? Would have made a better decision, better, probably could have made a better decision. Yeah, I think so. Hindsight is a wonderful thing for absolutely, absolutely. 
analyze what I did wrong would have helped in hindsight. Yep, but applying a different rationale. Yep. Okay, good. So, so what's going on with the mental simulation? What's happening? So the mental simulation, that, that sort of moment of challenge, if you like, invokes elements of both critical thinking and dissent. And I think because it asks, because it says, okay, your decision is, has not gone well, um, that's where the critical thinking comes in. And also that's where the dissent comes in. And it makes you go back. It makes you think, okay, what, what is the, what information did I actually use when I made that decision? Did I miss something? Did we miss something? Uh, it gives that unique information the ability to emerge and be interrogated and valued more highly. And I think then that gives a greater likelihood that that piece of information that you missed, that maybe that vital piece of information, it, it could be, maybe it comes into the decision-making process. Um, and I think also the within a group context, that experience provides a cooperative framework because I'm asking you all to imagine that your decision-making has failed effectively. And that creates for me, that creates a sort of safe space, if you will, where someone who's got that unique piece of information can say, hey, you know, we missed this. I've got this piece and I couldn't, I couldn't get it out before or we didn't maybe give it enough attention. Um, and that I think enables a more sort of cooperative environment to be created. So in summary, I guess, um, I, I'll sort of offer a few top tips as it were. Um, I think the first thing, as I would say, is we never take enough time when it comes to decisions, right? Uh, we're either always rushing or always confronted with deadlines or whatever. Um, I think framing the choice, you know, be clear about what you are deciding. What does everyone in the group think they're deciding? You know, is it about hiring Dawn or is it about something else? Is it about the product or is it about something else? What are the key decision criteria and make sure everyone is on the same page as far as that's concerned? Generate options, so narrow the choices. Top one, top two, top two, top three. Explore the consequences like the mental, the mental simulation, right? Test each option. If we, if this, then why? If we do this, let's imagine, let's pretend what happens. And there are always trade-offs when it comes to decision-making, but where, where are those trade-offs? Where are you willing to compromise? And I think there's another important piece, right? <clears throat> and this is where reflection comes in. Too many times the decision is like, okay, that's made, let's move on. But actually, you know, is it really, is it really done? You may be still, you may be paying, you know, dealing with the consequences of the decision. So keep bringing it out, keep challenging it. You ask yourself, you know, did we make the right choice? Did I make the right choice? Um, and if, if the answer is no, then, you know, that's when you need to sort of bring in the, the other elements, know that escalation of commitment is a challenge, know that you might need to make a different decision. So I've got a couple of other slides but I'm, that I just want to share with you at the end, but I'm just going to pause here and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Um, I can see a couple in the chat here. Uh, let's see, would you consider listing best and worst outcomes for each decision to be mental simulation? Uh, yes, I think potentially, um, provided that we are honest about the best and worst outcomes. Um, I think that, you know, uh, if, you, if, you, if you frame it in such a way that, you know, you really do want people to kind of focus on the worst outcomes, otherwise I think again, to sort of keep us all, to protect ourselves and to keep us all feeling, you know, safe rather than sorry, we tend to focus on the best outcomes rather than the worst outcomes. Whereas I think what the mental simulation does, it says you must focus on the outcomes because I'm telling you it's failed, right? Um, I learned to reflect on decisions and how I could do things better. It's always good to have a reminder, change your mind and hear different viewpoints. Yep, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. I subscribe to the view that sometimes making no decision can be more dangerous than making an incorrect decision. Is there a risk of stifling instinctively good decision makers or decisions itself through applying the mental simulation processes? No, 
I, I don't think there is. I mean, effectively, this is about, you know, you, you, it doesn't have to be a full on process, right? I think it is a, for me, I describe it as press pause. I describe it as a press pause. And that I'm not talking about, you know, standing and reading the label and thinking, okay, I'm going to buy, you know, for a half an hour, I'm going to buy this product or I'm not going to buy this product. I'm just, I'm just hitting almost like in an old cassette player, right? Hitting a, hitting a pause button and saying, okay, I'm just going to give this 15, 20 seconds. It's like when people say, you know, before you, um, when people say, you know, don't press the button on that email, right? Because in 30 seconds later, you'll feel bad about it. So I think it is just, it's, it's those times, basically, just taking that tiny little bit of extra time. Uh, and even if you're an instinctive decision maker, you know, I don't think that, you know, taking 10, 15, 30 seconds is, 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 is too damaged. Uh, AI is increasingly driving decision making in businesses. Is this a good thing? Well, I think this is a great question. I think that um, one of the things that I'm looking at at the moment, as I alluded to, is, you know, if you are making the decision in tandem with AI, how do you feel as the human in that relationship? Do you feel less confident about your own decision making? Do you feel more confident? Do you feel lazy because you're effectively relying on the AI? Um, uh, and I think that there's there's a lot here that needs to be spoken about. I mean, you know, we we know that when it comes to, for example, hiring, you know, certain keywords are, are focused on in the algorithms and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, I, like many things, you know, I like the whole debate about uh, flexible working, that the optimal for me is probably somewhere that combines the greatness of humans with the greatness of AI when it comes to just decision making, basically. It's just getting to that point. Um, so I just, uh, how can we separate personal anxieties and concerns from the decision making process in business settings, especially now the workplace and home I want and the same for many? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, uh, I think it, it, it really, um, I mean, I, I think that there, there's always overlap. And I think, you know, I'm not underestimating when I talk about decisions like going to the supermarket or waiting for a bus, you know, these are the same types of techniques, really. You know, they, they have the same impact. It's just when it comes to business um, or work or whatever business settings, you know, the decisions are potentially bigger, right? Um, and I think that's where, again, you know, the power of consultation. I mean, I do believe in the power of um, consultation, working with others, understanding perspectives. Um, but I think it's, and I think it's about having the right time, finding the right time for those decisions, basically, understanding the timing of when you're making your decisions. And remember, you know, again, it's a little bit like finding the best time to do your work. You know, if the decision is a hard one, maybe do it in the morning. Don't do it at five o'clock in the afternoon when everyone's had eight hours of Zoom meetings and is shattered, right? Um, you know. Okay, so a couple of last couple of last bits because I think James wants to say something. And again, it's a sunny Friday afternoon, and I'm sure everyone's exhausted. Uh, these are my publications. Um, I think the bottom one actually is is open access, so you can get access to that just uh, through the link. A um, few articles. I mean, I, I'm a big user of LinkedIn. You can absolutely connect, connect with me on LinkedIn. I've written a, vari a variety of things on LinkedIn about decision making, um, but also about a couple of other subjects. The top one is about, uh, you know, a call from my, from my own perspective about business and academia working better, trying to find a common language so that you bring together the best of both worlds, which is, you know, what I think we'll need as we emerge from the pandemic. Uh, I also produce with a couple of my colleagues uh, a business psych quarterly newsletter. I've uh, put some links in here. Um, if, again, if you, I think a lot of them are posted in the uh, HR um, LinkedIn group, um, so you can see them there. This is a couple of subjects that I've talked about recently: HR analytics, making better decisions. A lot of what we just talked about uh, when humans and AI collide improving 360 degree evaluation. So a range of different subjects of, uh, that I've written about. If you want to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn. I think I've seen a couple of requests. Um, just look for me, Dr. Dawn H. Nicholson. And also I have a University of Kent uh, webpage as well. And I'm, I'm very happy to connect. Um, and that's it. So shall I stop my share? 
Um, and then any any last comments, James, or timing over to you, I guess. Yeah, just first of all, thank you very much, Dawn. I'm, I'm going to practice some of those techniques now and uh, um, I'm going to review the slides, make sure that um, I try the different techniques and um, yeah, I think it's, it's something we can all put into, into use in business and personal life as well. So um, fantastic, really fantastic. Um, yeah, just, just want to say thank you, Dawn, for hosting it, this fascinating webinar. Um, thanks to our attendees for their questions and to everyone who took the time to attend today. Uh, thank you to Roddy and the HR, uh, HR Go group for sponsoring the HR network. Um, as Dawn said, if you want to hear any more about Dawn's field of research, please do get in contact. Um, you can also email us on hrnetwork at kent.ac.uk. Uh, we do have a short feedback questionnaire, which we will be grateful if you can fill in. We'll send that out after the event, but it will help us to improve future events. Um, and just to let you know, we have an upcoming knowledge and networking event covering the to topic of flexible working on Thursday the 13th of May. Um, if you haven't signed up, please feel free to do so. Um, but most of all, we'd like to wish you a fantastic weekend. Thank you very much. Enjoy the sunshine. Thanks, everyone.